Welcome to the International Symposium on Democracy, Global Citizenship and Transformative Education, New Perspectives to Understand, Engage and Act Together. My name is Peter Andrich, I will chair this session and I will also present this session with my wonderful colleague Shirley Steinberg. It does feel a bit awkward to chair my own session, but Shirley promised to, to introduce me, so it, it won't be that bad. But Shirley is the first speaking speaker today, so I will first introduce her. Shirley Steinberg is a research professor of critical youth studies at the University of Calgary. She's the author and editor of many books on critical pedagogy, critical media literacy, urban and youth culture, and cultural studies. Regular, regular contributor to CBC Radio 1, CTV, the Toronto Globe and Mail, the Montreal Gazette, and Canadian Press, she's an internationally known speaker and teacher. Shirley is the senior editor of the New Stage International Handbook of Critical Pedagogies and author of the second edition of The Stigma of Genius, Einstein, Consciousness and Critical Education. The author, author of over 40 books and many articles, her narrative scholarship juxtaposes itself between the historical, the historiographical and the contemporary absurd and unjust. The former director of the Paolo and Nita Freire International Project for Critical Pedagogy, Shirley is the founder of the International Institute of, of Critical Pedagogy and Transformative Leadership. She is committed to a global community of transformative educators and community workers engaged in radical love, social justice, and the situating of power within social and cultural contexts, specifically involving youth. Shirley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Petar. And it's so good to see everybody here. It's really, uh, we feel humbled to see you all here. Before I start, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, Canada. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, which is comprised of the Siksika, the Piccany and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I'd like to note that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Alberta River or the Elbow River. That is called the city of Calgary. And I would like to add my parenthetical uh, editorial statement that it is stolen land that we reside on. Many years ago, Michael will remember this. He's probably the oldest one here, except for me. Um, Burton Cummings wrote a song. It was recorded by the Guess Who Canadian group. Have you been around? Have you done your share of coming down on different things that people do? Have you been aware? You've got brothers and sisters who care about what's going to happen to you in a year from now. And maybe I'll be there to shake your hand. Maybe they'll be there to share the land that they'll be given away when we all live together. It's interesting that so many years ago, probably close to four decades or five decades ago, a song was written about sharing the land, a land which has now become so much a form of consternation, worry, fear, and desecration. So my thoughts are, are we going to be here to share the land and the notions of creating an echo pedagogy? During a May trip into the Canadian Rockies, my daughter Megan texted me that she was on the lookout for wild animals. It was a, a month into the virus and everything was very quiet and we only live about a, an hour away from the Rockies. Living near the Rockies, we often see critters, mountain goats, white-tailed deer, and an occasional moose. Indeed, the deer to us are dangerous predators in Alberta because they smash and grab our gardens, trounce our landscape. Megan's search didn't seem particularly significant to me until she noted that the park rangers reported that there was a sighting of a white bear. A woman tells the story about the white bear in, a, in an article that followed in the newspaper. She said, for us, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity, which is probably the only reason we slowed down to take a little bit of video of it. We took the time and the opportunity to sort of educate our son about bears, hibernation and berries and keeping them safe. It was great to talk about our environment, where we live and how we relate, how we relate to them and what a better way to explain it to them that to live and be in live with the wildlife that we're about to talk about. I have to note that after the bear was found to be a grizzly, they were only about seven feet away from the bear. 
However, this mom was talking about her own type of environmental education, of eco-pedagogy, and a unique opportunity to share this white bear with, with her children. While a sweet and encouraging and somewhat very dangerous story, my underlying theme is that we do not have acceptable eco-pedagogy in North America and indeed in most of the world. We do not have the words, the background, the examples, nor the scholarly resources to create an environmentally savvy populace. The uniqueness of this nature scene unravels into the everyday and expands into a global mural where we contextualize why was this family even able to see a grizzly in the wild? It was day 61 of the pandemic, and there was something called an urban wild in its infancy. An article by the Guardian during the same time talks about mountain goats marching single file in Wales, joggers carefully avoiding rabid coyotes during the day in Tel Aviv, and at night on the same path passing jackals who were howling on their running trail. A sea lion was wailing in front of a closed store door in Buenos Aires, and a pack of sleeping gray langurs were dancing in the middle of the highway in India. The urban wild had begun. A few months after Megan's white bear report, my partner and I ran into a, a brown bear once again in the Rocky Mountains. We pulled over and watched the bear with, with naivety. No, 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 with ignorance of people who have no context of eco landscaping and a pedagogy for appropriate ways to view animals. It was not until the bear was about seven feet from my car with an open window that it occurred to me indeed that a brown bear in our mountains was absolutely a grizzly bear. A neighbor of ours has been consistently shooting films about a large bobcat who has been consistently visiting her yard. I've been following her Facebook posts about her newly adopted cute kitty whom she now feeds and allows to sun in her yard every day. Responding to her posts, I noted gently, as most of you know, I'm a very gentle person, that a friend of mine had a very large dog who was attacked and killed by the same animal, a bobcat, that very year. I suggested that maybe hosting a predatory cat in her backyard was not a great idea. As I expected, I was shunned and silenced by the bobcat mom and others. I was a troublemaker. Of course, the cat was safe in her yard and they were safe too. We have daily sightings of coyotes. Most people begin to approach them thinking they're stray dogs and then realize until they're far too close that they're not. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, a medium sized little dog was killed by a coyote that people thought were, was cute. In our local world right now, we see enormous jackrabbit hares who turn snow white in the winter and are mottled brown in the summer. They're the size of large cats or small dogs. These lagomorphs lurk around entrances of homes and porches. When we worked at University of Calgary in a building, we would often run into a colony of six or seven of these giant rabbits. That was our only normal. Now the rabbits are gone because the predatory beasts have eaten most of them. So now this is our new normer, which consists of marauding dangerous beasts, choosing to go wherever they decide to bed down, raid gardens, and leave excrement. Most people think it's really cute. Less than a couple of weeks ago, a beloved naturalist and scholar was doing his evening jog about 20 miles from me. He was attacked by a bear and pushed over a cliff. This death shocked many because he was an echo pedagogue, an echo work person, and he became, uh, sorry, echo woke person, and he became prey. The tragedy reminds us that while we can be educated, respectful, and alert, there is no way to predict the behaviors of non humans. Actually, we really can't predict the behavior of most humans. So how can we become environmental pedagogues and facilitate the notion of, as Burton Cummings put it, a shared land? While the mom who was interviewed in the paper at the sighting of the white bear was tapping into the notion of her own ad hoc eco-pedagogy on the ground, authentic, respectful, and undisturbing to nature, she was doing so without being informed. And our colleague who went out for his simple run in a known area who was trained to deal with wildlife was a victim of the unexpected. 
Ecopedagogy originally, which was known and discussed as environmental education, has been bantered around since the advent of recycling in North American circles, yet it remains at best an add on topic reduced to little ones growing cute little seeds in the window or going to the zoo. The notion of an experiential ecopedagogy has been introduced into some areas, often with the cooperation of park, range, park rangers, or often under the guise of a collaboration with First Nations or Indigenous peoples. But rarely do we locate a curricular example which looks at responsibilities, pasts and futures of the environment or of our global ecosystem. Achieving a notion of authentic and critical ecopedagogy requires a change of the way of being with and through nature, which we currently have. A critical read of human beings in eco-pedagogical ways of knowing must acknowledge the arrogant, narcissistic human ways that being of ways of being that surround and continue to destroy our planet. Critical pedagogical eco curricula must begin with an early awareness and respect of the impact humans have on our climate, uh, climate and planet and the logical peril for their own future. A critical approach to ecopedagogy insists on the realization that harm happens if respect for the environment and non-human structures is not learned at an early age. Early childhood education is not too early to begin a new critical ecopedagogy. While we teach of traffic lights and signs, danger and safety, an early incorporation of safety for the urban wild, flora and fauna must be respect, respected and articulated. Given the notion of natural amazement engagement that most children seem to be born with, educators can critically take a hold of the childlike instinct to embrace the natural, to share the land with informative, engaged and respectful pedagogy. As far as working with youth goes, that would appear to be more accessible and readily taught looking at the oft critical stance that youth tend to have of their parents' generation and lack of their respect for environment. Greta Thunberg should not be the only name attached to echo respect and pedagogy. Educators can introduce youth to add to the voice that Thornberg has shared. Critical questions can be asked, how can we be involved in a social awareness of the need for echo pedagogy? Indeed, Inter environmental education, now eco-pedagogy, has always been on kind of the elite menu of bougie parents and educators, the kind of middle to upper class schools who have time for the luxury of looking at environment. It's certainly ignored in most urban educational systems. And now, compliments of COVID-19, we have an urban wild in many cities, and this may not change. Nor will, nor will plagues or viruses. We're not prepared. So not only our students are not repaired, adults will need prompting and convincing that this indeed is essential education. We haven't done such a great job, especially when it comes to non-renewable resources and sustainability. And that tends to be looking at foresting, oil, and gas. How on earth can we work to have educators and parents address an echo pedagogy? I live in a province where it is expected that 50% of adults will ultimately refuse to be vaccinated against COVID. North America, and actually in many places in Europe, have become a place in which a breath of warning or an inkling of echo consciousness is called partisan, political, where fundamentalist groups insist that they are being controlled and manipulated by the deep state. It's not just that the echo pedagogical way of seeing is essential, but that a criticalization of our state on earth and humans is in imminent danger of extinction. Voices from those who have been under peril of extinction through historical attempts of annihilation haunt us. My beloved colleague and brother Four Arrows notes in his book, Sitting Bull speaks that traditional ecological or indigenous science may be the only way to rebalance life systems on earth now, that this knowledge knows how to connect all systems and put them back into holistic balance. He notes that Sitting Bull may not have found a way to stop smallpox, but he was trying to understand it and to mitigate its harm. If we had such a holistic perspective, our world would not be so out of balance today. 
we would better understand COVID-19, its cause, its nature, and its warning. Three years ago, we had treacherous fires in a place called Waterton Lakes National Park. It's part of Glacier National Park, which includes both Montana and the United States and Canada. And I actually behind me have my Zoom background is a picture of Chief Mountain, which is the spiritual home of Waterton Parks. Most of Waterton was decimated by fire, even all the way into the town site where the hotels and homes were. Many things were destroyed and it was set to rest basically and most of the land closed off for over a year. This was the land of the buffalo, the, the traditional native lands of the Kainai Blackfoot people who had been moved to the reserve, which is about 20 miles west of there, which is a prairie. Of course, these people are not farmers. They never were. They were traditional hunters. They were removed from the land that you see behind me. Um, and consequently, uh, as fires do, lightning strikes and there was a huge fire. It was predicted and has been predicted that the land will not grow back for probably 100 to 120 years. Normally forests, normally in another world, forests uh, regrow much quicker. The problem being that this particular traditional land is land of the buffalo. And during fires, which happen constantly in the mountains and in forests, after that, the buffalo are there to tramp down and recreate the important ecosystem by the weight of the buffalo by living there and eating there. Because we have no buffalo, the few on-site buffalo, all 20 of them that were there for tourists had been removed to the north. There is no echo balance there to recreate a forest that for thousands of years has always replenished itself due to the buffalo. And indeed, because of, of the intervention of civilization, what is now gently called settlers, but white colonists, um, we have lost our buffalo and the ecosystem in Waterton will take, as I said, possibly 12 decades to replenish itself. There is no, there is no model, a template that I'm gonna show you, Shirley's curriculum of ecopedagogy, Shirley's critical curriculum of ecopedagogy, because to create a curriculum for very much an audience of students and parents who have no, intuitive understanding that is this is needed is very, very challenging. How does one go into schools and go to politicians and say, this, this is math, this is science, this is technology, we must understand this in order to survive. Uh, like I said, to have one, you, one um, young woman uh, attended to mostly because she's young and kind of a, Greta is kind of a, you know, a star in a sense. I'm not talking about what she knows, but the fact that Americans and uh, Europeans tend to like, like celebrity. So they create one celebrity in a young girl to speak for all of us, to speak for the land. And it's not enough. This is not about a popularization of who can say cool things, but this is about a re-examination and a demand from people like us to absolutely demand there be a conversation that is, I can't say depoliticized, but that is not threatening to be a political issue. That is a conversation of criticality, a conversation about safety, um, a conversation about the ability to sustain both human beings, animals, and the plants as well, because we're also seeing tremendous problems with poisoning and illnesses done by plants that are unknown and not understood. There's not an ending to this. This is basically a rant and a demand to find a way to create an ecopedagogy that can be criticalized and safe for all people to employ. And now I'll, you can turn it over to me, Peter, to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Shirley. <laughs> it's really, it, it's really an amazing, it's a really an amazing talk. Yeah. 
Okay, so now I'll take Peter's job back and I'll introduce Peter Jandrik. He is professor at the Zagreb University of Applied Sciences in Croatia, and he's visiting professor also at University of Wolverhampton in the UK. His previous academic affiliations include Croatian Academic and Research Network, the National E-Science Center at the University of Edinburgh, Glasgow School of Art, and Cass School of Education at the University of East London. Petar's research interests are situated at the post-disciplinary intersections between technologies, pedagogies, and the society, and research methodologies of his choice are inter- trans and anti-disciplinarity. He is the editor-in-chief of Post Digital Science and Education Journal and book series. Petar's recent books include Post Digital Dialogues on Critical Pedagogy, Liberation Theology and Information Technology, co-authored with Peter McLaren, and Knowledge Socialism, The Rise of Peer Production, Collegiality, Collaboration, and Collective Intelligence, co-authored with Michael Peters, Tina Beasley, and Zuel Judang. And I'll turn this over now to Peter. Thank you very much, Shirley, uh, for this amazing introduction. Uh, I would like to again thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk together with you, Shirley, because it's really a great privilege to be here with one of the people I read when I was just beginning my journey into critical pedagogy. And I also really appreciate the effort of, of all of you who are with us today, because in our COVID-19 world, when where these online talks proliferate so much that it's impossible to attend all events of interest, I really appreciate that you took the time for our discussion. So as we talk here in May 2021, the COVID-19 pandemic is well in its second year. And reflecting on our early responses to the pandemic, I cannot but notice significant changes in my thinking and feeling over the past months. So during first lockdowns in spring last year, the pandemic seemed like a terrible event that I needed to get over with. Yet my bad feelings can be strongly alleviated by a tremendous sense of global and local solidarity, and the crisis felt like a unique historical opportunity for desperately needed changes in global capitalism. As we enter the second pandemic summer, however, while many of these solidarity projects continue, I'm just exhausted, and I know that I'm not the only one. So beginning with our ambiguous and precarious situation, I believe that the humankind now needs to collectively develop more sustainable and just ways of being. And this is a cognitive and effective project. We need critique and criticism as well as courage, creativity, imagination, hope, and organization. We need new goals and new practical measures towards reaching these goals. We need new utopias, new pedagogical and political programs, designs, and experiments that fit our pandemic age and the age of the, of the Anthropocene. So in this talk, I argue that critical pedagogy can help us develop such utopias and political programs. Paulo Freire once said that education needs both technical and scientific training as well as dreams and utopias. However, mainstream critical pedagogy tends to view the research field as concerned with the effects of digital media and other technologies on the existing activities of teaching, learning, and education, thus continuing to assume a clear division between the authentic uh, educational practice and the imposition of an external and novel technology. What I will argue in this talk is that technological and scientific aspects of the human conditions are mutually constitutive with critical pedagogy. And therefore, I will also argue that critical pedagogy needs to significantly reinvent itself in order to meet the post-digital challenge. And I would like to start this with a short biographical note. My first interest and my first degree was in physics. And it was only really after a few years of working in physics and informatics that I learned about critical pedagogy. Learning about critical consciousness relationships within education and class and so on was so liberating. Yet I almost immediately began to wonder, so why don't critical pedagogues engage with digital technologies a bit more seriously? And since then, I embarked on a mission to connect my love for critical pedagogy with my love for science and technology. About 10 years ago, Peter McLaren and I embarked on a series of conversations about critical pedagogy fit for our present times. And unlike many founding figures and even younger members of the, of the movement who stubbornly keep to fair and ideas and doctrines, Peter has always been open for exploring the intersections between critical pedagogy and technology. So over the years, Peter and I published many articles together, some books and so on. And what <coughs> you see on the screen is the book of our dialogues published late last year. 
So these efforts with Peter and other colleagues have been really productive. Yet over the years, I started to realize their limitations because we can write as many books and articles as humanly possible, but our ideas will be truly productive only if considered seriously by other people. And academic publications obviously have a very limited reach. So we need a stronger voice and that implies development of a wider community. A few years ago with a group of closest academic friends, I founded post-digital science and education journal and book series. The concept of the post-digital is quite complex and I don't have enough time in this presentation to give you my usual half hour introduction. At this point, it suffices to say that the post-digital is a gathering concept which takes into account critical pedagogy in science and technology in equal measure. So having published more than 250 papers and some books over the past couple of years, the post-digital science and education community gets stronger by the day. And as the editor of the journal and the book series, I have a bird eye view of the themes and ideas at the intersections of critical pedagogy and information technology. So this brings me to the core of today's presentation. In what follows, I will distill the main post-digital challenges for our contemporary critical pedagogy and offer some signposts for addressing them. Before I move on, however, I need to give a bit of a background for this presentation. In November last year, I was invited to give a talk on the post-digital challenge of critical pedagogy. And to my surprise, I realized that I never really published something of that kind. Soon after Derek Ford and I started writing an article on the topic. In the meantime, we decided to develop this work, work into a book. And today I present the latest update of our work in progress, which has in the meantime been presented in several places and always in different versions. Because every time I speak in public, I learn something new from my audience and I build back into our work. So the first influence is critical philosophy of technology and studies of science and technology. So during the past few decades, much of political pedagogy has either ignored emerging techno-social challenges or has approached them using one on another determinist and instrumentalist position. In the meantime, philosophers such as Andrew Feinberg, Christian Fuchs, and many others have built on the body of work from Karl Marx to Frankfurt School and others to develop some nuanced approaches to human relationships between today's technology. In the context of scientific research, critical philosophy of technology gave birth to the field of inquiry called Science and Technology Studies or STS, which explores complex relationships between culture, politics, technological innovation and society. It claims that all knowledge and technology is socially constructed and reaches all the way into questions pertaining to collective decision making, including but not limited to the theme of this Congress, which is democracy. Recent developments in STS also look into transformations such as commodification and assistization of various public goods. Insights for criti from critical philosophy of technology and science and technology studies are crucial for various central questions of critical pedagogy. Development of a realistic understanding of power structures and techno-social relationships, critical epistemologies, struggles against various forms of epist epistemicide, development of self-reflective solidarity, and so on. During our constant interactions with various digital systems, we produce huge streams of data. These large streams, often called big data, fill the algorithmic artificial intelligence systems. And then the computers independently establish various connections between input data and produce intelligent solutions to new problems in non predetermined ways. So this interplay between big data and algorithms is used to sell us products, calculate our taxes and eligibility for social and other services, monitor our health, assess our students, and so on. However, algorithm, algorithmic processes are far from neutral as the complex systems of data production and representation co-constitute the very systems that purport to describe. And in this process, they often embed, replicate, or reinforce pre-existing attitudes and prejudices. So depending on their, on their focus, authors describe these changes using various names, including data capitalism, algorithmic capitalism, and so on. Yet the common thread concerns the changing relationships of knowledge within capitalism and the ways that knowledge and even opposition or critical knowledge can be captured within the circus of surplus production. So critiques of capitalism have, have always been in the heart of critical pedagogy and post digital critical pedagogy needs to seriously grapple with the emerging forms of capitalism and their connections with data and algorithms. During the second half of the 20th century, we slowly but surely digitized all traditional information sources, books, films, and even human genome. In these days, however, there's not, not much left to be digitized, and the focus of digitization has taken a U-turn. So in 2008, Craig Winter described this shift in a quote that you just saw on your screens and which you will just remove now. 
In his 2012 presentation, What is Life? Bentley responds to his own question. We can digitalize life and we can generate life from the digital world. Scientists actually send digital code to each other instead of sending genes or proteins because it's faster and cheaper to synthesize a gene than to clone it or even to get it by Federal Express. These scientific developments are, are linked to the political economy because we now live in the age of bioinformational capitalism, which is based on a self-organizing and self-replicating code that harnesses both the results of the information and the new bi biology revolutions and brings them together in a powerful alliance that enhances and strengthens or, or reinforce, reinforces each other. This is Michael Peters' words, by the way. In our pandemic times, the idea that various techno-social systems, such as code and ecosystems in information, publishing, education, and emerging knowledge journal systems can be described using our insights into viral behavior, now also attracts a lot of attention. So bioinformation, its emerging political economy, and the viral behavior of many social phenomena are crucial for the for development of new critical pedagogies. While critical pedagogy projects have generally engaged with critiques of capitalism, others have ins insisted on the international, global, and tra or transnational nature of capitalism and its in intrinsic relationships to colonialism and imperialism. Kari Malat, a good friend of mine, for instance, importantly shows that struggle for socialism entails, at its very core, the struggle for the self-determination of oppressed nations. And these struggles must not, must not be ignored or condemned, but rather understood as inspiration for our own struggles. It is interesting to know that Freire himself has also taken this perspective, not only by calling on Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, Fidel Castro, and Che Guevara and pedagogy of the oppressed, but also in, in his pedagogy in process and letters to Guinea-Bissau, where he looked to the pedagogy of Amical Cabral. So confirming Malat's thesis is the notable absence of consideration of these key works of Freire in the North American critical pedagogy tradition, although there have been important exceptions, including but not limited to Peter McLaren and Sandy Crande. Feminism is a broad concept, which includes a wide range of theories, social movements and practices aimed at gender, gender equality. Starting around 2012, the main contours of the fourth wave of feminism include the focus on technology and intersectionality. Contemporary technological innovations such as social media now allow feminists of the fourth wave to take up the micropolitics of the third wave while situating their individual lived experiences within broader global discourses. Hence, in recent years, we have seen a rise in the number of feminist movements. Probably the best example of the resistance and challenges to sexism, patriarchy, and other forms of oppression by a feminist uptake of digital communication is the MeToo movement, of course, which has significantly expanded the traditional limits of feminist activism. Major contributions of the fourth wave to popular discourse also include development of new terms, such as mansplaining, which is based on Rebecca Solnit's recent book, Main is Play Things to Me. The fourth wave of feminism also reaches beyond the mere expansion of traditional feminist struggle in the new media. In words of Harriet Kimball Rye, the fourth wave of feminism addresses the limit of materialism, the need to turn from concerns about me to concern for the planet and all its beings, and the sense that for us in the fourth wave, what is most important is to put ourselves in the service of the world. It is with this interest that the fourth wave of feminism directly speaks to the bioinformational challenge of new capitalisms, while modernity, critical posthumanism, and transhumanism, and other interests of new post digital critical pedagogies. Intermixing significantly with the Trajectories in the former sections, Black and anti-racist racist scholarship has insisted on the centrality of racial categories within the knowledge, research, and pedagogy, although it has predominantly centered on the US and Western tradition. From critical race theories that challenged uh, liberal multiculturalist education to critical whiteness studies and abolitionist pedagogy, racism and white supremacy can no longer be viewed as incidental or personal. At the same time, the proliferation and transformation of intersectionality theory has productively disrupted and reconfigured this scholarship. This is an educational project within and beyond schools. Uh, and for instance, today's mass incarceration in the US is a means of absorbing and controlling the surplus population, particularly the sectors that has challenged the capitalist system over the half past half century, the African-American people. So this absorption and control are now fully post-digital with the prison no longer confined to the designated spaces, physical spaces, but spreading throughout society for ankle monitors and more. 
The shape and components of racist and identity-based ecosystems are inescapable and urgent problems for post-digital critical pedagogy. Post-humanism is a common way for a wide name for a wide array of theories which reject human dominance and often human uniqueness in nature. Transhumanism accepts many features of post-humanism, yet retains human exceptionalism, so transhumanism is an extension of the humanist project, whereas post-humanism is critical of humanism. Critical post-humanism focuses on the intersections between human and non-human agency and conceptualizes knowledge and capacities and being emergent from the webs of interconnections between heterogeneous entities, both human and non-human. So for Rosie Bredotti, what makes post-human studies critical has to do with its relationship to the developments in capitalism. When the human and the non-human become collective thinking subjects, they create forms and subjects of knowledge that cannot be fully captured by the shift that speeds and acceleration of capital. In education, critical post-humanism speaks not only about the decentering of the student-teacher relationships or the inclusion of non-human actors as pedagogical agents, but about the complete reconceptualization and reorganization of the educational process overall. Indeed, during and after the COVID lockdowns, where digital communication is at a historical peak, just like today, these new contours are crit crucial for development of post-digital critical pedagogies. The emergence of critical disability studies has been very important for critical pedagogy. Critical disability studies have originally been situated within the distinction between the medical model of disability, which locates disability as a problem within the individual, and the social model of disability, which locates disability as the organization of society that turns an impairment into a disability. However, the field has moved beyond this binary. And in our post-digital condition, we can think of disability as a relation between all humans, and we might add non-humans as well. It's a relationship in, wind in which we are all implicated. So anthropometric technologies, now fully post-digital, continue to produce ontological hierarchies of beings, orders of inclusion, and differential inclusions. Those hierarchies and orders also produce surplus value for bioinformational capitalism. So the question is, what would happen if critical pedagogies took up this historical material as an internationalist challenge to knowledge and intelligence or theory of biology? The notion of queer has been taken up, or some may say reclaimed, as an identity. Yet an expansive body of literature foregrounds queerness as that which can never be an identity, but can only disturb identity. This variety of queerness continues to infect queer theory, even if what are considered the founding works. So resisting the certainty of knowledge and embracing the opacity and now knowingness that queerness can help but inaugurate, post-digital critical pedagogies can find their curriculum forgetting and failing, allowing us to access, access other models of relating, belonging, and caring. And these utopian possibilities, of course, are not only prophetic, but properly messianic and have a lot of off to offer to post-digital pedagogies. The first documented use of the term post-digital actually came from aesthetic theory. And in 2000, Kinkas coined the term as a result of the fact that the, that the revolutionary period of digital information age has surely passed, and the digital technologies no longer significantly disrupt life. So post-digital aesthetics can be viewed more broadly as a zone of inter in determinacy and uncertainty of our age. And post-digital critical pedagogies can help attune education, politics, and research to devise the complex ecologies that act on, inform, and transform our senses and perceptions. This is true not only for other than human voices, but also for those human voices that deprived of recognition and those forms of discourse and matter that appear to be beyond the sensible. Science fiction has anticipated many inventions such as submarines and so on. And, but according to Paul Levinson, if you look at the history of science, you will find science fiction is a is profound backdrop. This relationship is two directional because science fiction is part of science and also needs to be based in science. So Paul Levinson says that the interplay between science and science fiction is a trajectory of progress. Of course, a more systematic approach can be found in the area of future studies and responding to inherent messiness and non-predictability of our post-digital existence, science fiction and future studies offer inspiration in year of years of methodological experience in grappling with the future. In our current pandemic moment, which requires urgent development of new approaches to present and future, this inspiration and experience is crucial for development of new critical pedagogies. 
The last one is myth, religion, and belief. Humans are not just beings of logic. We are also beings of myth and faith. So critical pedagogy has recognized this long time ago, especially for its strong connections with the Latin American tradition of liberation pedagogy. In our book, Post Digital Dialogues, <laughs> Peter and I wrote that the realm of religion is the realm of myth, symbol, art, mystery, legend, theater, and poetry. So all these realms that we can delve deeply into the meaning of life. And as we need to understand the world in order to change it, liberation technology needs social science in as much as social science needs technology. Of course, this is a hard pill to swallow for diehard Marxists, which cling to the idea that all religion is open for the people. Thusly, liberation theology has created some deep divides between the critical pedagogy movement. However, regardless of one's, views, one's views about organized religions, various forms of spirituality are hugely influential in our post-digital reality. For this reason, critical post-digital critical pedagogies also need to take into account myth, religion, and belief. To wrap up this presentation, I show a photo of Peter McLaren and myself taking next to Paolo Freire's bust in Chapman University's campus. I show this photo because I like it, to show off a bit, but also because of its powerful symbolic. Showing three generations of critical pedagogues, the photo sends a message that we would not be here today without our, without our intellectual ancestors, yet we should not succumb to a temptation to freeze their ideas and turn them into a dogma. We need to carry on the message of critical pedagogy without compromise, and we should not shy away from reinventing this message in and for the times we live in. In our post-digital reality, Freire's messianic utopia with his hopeful and courageous view to the future that is also here and now is needed more than ever. Critical pedagogy and its critics, detractors and enthusiasts offer decades of experience in the trenches of formal and informal schooling under all imaginable conditions and the ability to find its way for the direst of crisis and probably most importantly, the ability to reinvent itself across the crisis. Yes, contemporary critical pedagogy movement is still deeply connected with the fair and understanding of human relations through technology and is therefore ripe for a deep in reinvention and reconsideration in and for our post-digital bioinformational reality. The challenges, lineages, debates, and directions charted in this presentation speak to the contemporary human conditions from a wide variety of perspectives. Some of these perspectives are not fully commensurable, Others significantly overlap and use different paths to, allow, to arrive to similar conclusion. We are at the very brink of the post-digital age, and this messy and sometimes paradoxical nature of our knowledge is just a part of the game. So at this moment in history, we cannot sure, be sure which of the perspectives I addressed in these talks, perspectives Derek and I forgot to address, and various combinations of all perspectives present as absent, will be more relevant than the next one. This will depend on the cognitive and effective dimension of our utopic pedagogic imaginings. Yet we do know, and without hesitation, that the questions and dilemmas of our post-digital age need to be addressed in educational theory, policy, politics, and practice, and that critical pedagogy is a particularly right place for the growth. So critical pedagogies have to consider these nexuses and these avowed fantasies of political, bodily, and digital immunity to embrace the opacity, contingency, uncertainty, and independent vulnerability of all things, to transform the animacy hierarchy into a horizontal configuration of human, non-human, and object. We need to invent new post-digital pedagogies that are critical and creative, certain and indeterminate, transparent and opaque, and that accept and negotiate the contamination of the constantly shifting borders between humans, machines, natures, non-human animals and objects. In our pandemic moment, the lines of inquiry identified in this presentation offer some signposts and references we might use to develop such critical pedagogies. Thank you so much for your attention and special thanks to organizers once again who invited me to this talk and of course to Derek Ford who helped me formulate the presented ideas. I do hope that these signposts and references will be useful in development of new post-digital critical pedagogies in times to come. Thank you, Peter. That was wonderful. I, I believe there's a question in the chat and it's for Shirley. Would you like to address that? It's from Sebastian. I can read it if you'd like. Sure, sure. 
Thanks, Sebastian. I, I, your point about Greta and the cult of celebrity makes me wonder if we are to enact societal change where we need to discard the model of the leader hero and somehow find a way to have a decentralized movement. I mean, I know I don't think we're mature enough, but yes, I agree. I mean, even Petar just, you know, we're talking about a man who's just turned 100 years old. He's been dead t uh, almost 30 years. And we, we have that's it like that's all we have is Paulo I mean we've got you know Pete and Henry and Mike Apple and you know different people Deborah Britzman um and then we have the next generation like Paul and Michael and you know stuff like that but we don't we we can't even get away from this entire human nature of having idealism and heroes all the time, it's always the same. Um, as Jews, we sell non-religious Jews. We celebrated a holiday the other day, which is a celebration of the Torah coming down the mountain to Moses or something like that. And the point being is that even at that time, when the Jews were there grabbing, you know, talking to God directly, dude and he them were just friends all over the place. They had to to build a golden calf to worship. There is something human. I mean, it it's kind of goes back to religion, Sebastian it's the same thing it's like humans have to have someone to look after them there's always this need to have and it usually is a, a male but not always but yeah it is but but that idea of of this constant looking after so Greta becomes part of that exactly what you said the cult of celebrity and I'd like to say oh it's North Americans but be in Asia and look at the cult of celebrity be in Africa it's it's the same everywhere and the only time you don't see it honestly is going back to the indigenous ways of knowing um, and indigeneity, I mean, they don't even really, at least in her um, tribal groups, don't refer to God, they refer to creator. And it's not the creator, but it's the notion of creator. But there's always, and which could be anything from Mother Nature to, you know, a robot. There's no description. But this idea, no, I don't think we're mature enough. I don't. Like the beauty of critical pedagogy is when you go to one of our sessions, nobody can give you a happy face at the end. Any any other any other comments questions? Uh, this is this is really really interesting. Uh, I do have a comment before somebody else uh, thinks of theirs. Uh, we recently published a, I, with a group of people. I recently published a paper called "Who Remembers Greta Thunberg?" And one of the problems that I found with the celebrity cultures is this terrible ephemerality. So even though Greta was speaking about hugely important topics and she was big in all media, once the pandemic, the pandemic hit in, actually she disappeared. She was nowhere anymore. She was not in any media at all. And such important questions, I believe, shouldn't really depend on the moment, on the any celebrity on any type of this type of this type of thing anyway michael asked any comment on the political crisis authoritarian popular populism white supremacy conspiracy theories and the intersections of the political crisis with your specific topics shirley well yeah there's always comments from people like us on all of those things that you know but it's talking about like beating the dead horse you know it's like this consistent me see and if you know if i was hauled up in front of the ultimate judge in the world and they say what is the problem with today's world i'd like to say white christian men but i don't know that and it's so that kind of entails most of y'all in here but um or you may be the child product product of one but that's so simplistic it's it's so simplistic, but how do we move from an ID from a an icon needed uh, culture? I mean, you go to Asia and we see the the Nike icons and the and you go to Vietnam and you see the Ho Chi Minh icons I mean there's always an icon somewhere it's like the inability of humans to follow nature and their soul it, it's yeah it is those comments on the political crisis the, and, the, and this time it's worse I mean I have to admit that the buffoon from the United States 
encouraged a movement that has been waiting to go. It would be stupid to say that before 2016, uh, Norwegian youth, for instance, weren't obsessed with death metal and white supremacy, and that Germany was being populated by a skinhead movement. That would be crazy. And we all know what the, what's going on with the US. So the notion of annihilation of everyone, it's like if I had to define the world to an alien, it's been that it's the ideology of the annihilation of everyone but my kind of people is a good thing. Brilliant, Shirley, thanks. I would perhaps say that when we speak about conspiracy theories especially, that things such as the anti-vaccination movement and so on are really not only a product of, of, of uh, some, some grim people who write something in some dark rooms and then do whatever, but they are, they are, they are also a product of educational neglect which goes on for many, many years because it is actually not in the interest of, of, of capitalism to really have people who think with their, with their own minds. And this, is, and this is, I think, a hugely problematic uh, thing that when we, talk about, when we talk about problems such as populism, authoritarian populism, religious populism, conspiracy theories, we can add post-truth and so on, that even when you take a look, I work at the School of Informatics, and then we have these things such as, you know, critical literacy, teaching kids how to whatever, do, do, do uh, see how to determine which online content is good or bad, but actually the word critical used there is not critical at all. It's critical only in a sense which suits fits the overall system and doesn't really it's not critical in the sense that we understand the word critical so yeah there's there's a lot going on there any 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 comments from the audience perhaps i need to be a moderator as well so please paul you turn on your mic it will help yeah yeah thanks <laughs> i did have a a question but i think io also had her hand up so i don't know if you want to go first io um, so I guess what I was wondering is, um, Shirley was talking about this sort of politicization of sort of eco pedagogy. Um, and maybe, um, I think this is a very personal sort of activist -y question, but how might we, or if you have any insights onto how might we achieve this sort of expanded sense of solidarity, given that there's this shift to these sort of like even the center looks at sort of like this expanded neoliberal project of dismantling social structures that might protect the environment. And then we have a shift to even further far right ideologies that seek to just dismantle any solidarity, it seems like amongst people at all. Um, and so I feel this push to become more radical and more progressive, but at the same time realize that I'd like to reach across the aisle, but I feel like I am afraid of becoming burned or else having my own um, kind of morals corrupted by like a lot of fear and hate and, and just ideologies that completely alienate me as a person. <laughs> I don't know. Um, hi, Io. It's nice to meet you in real life, <laughs> real fake life. Um, I guess when you, I hear you speak to me that the, I don't think we have any hope of saving or health or happiness through any generation until we get to the youth generation, probably under 25. I think that's the only possible solution we have, not in the Greta sense, but in the in just the larger sense of if, you know, I've kind of decided I'm I just don't think anybody else is worth working for with at this point. I just want to work at youth. I see we're, uh, people from everything from Greta to like Celia Ho, who at like 10 years old started to save elephants in China. Um, you know, there's there's so many stories of kid activists. And I just think, um, you know, those of you who have children at home, you know, work the youth. I mean, and the thing is, is I was 
you know, the fact is, is that youth are glad to go up against adults at all times. So milk that, let, let us work with the youth in attacking our own people in a sense. I just think that's our only hope as youth. I would I would add from a from a, I completely agree of course and I would just add that from a post digital or post humanist or bioinformational perspective we do need to extend solidarity to all human to all beings not just human beings I think it's hugely important because you know I'll just I'll just give a funny example I hope I'm going to be funny because if we destroy this lake or sea which is behind Miranda, then there will be no more fish which is on my t-shirt. <laughs> and, 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 and when there's no more fish which is on my t-shirt, then Aoi has nothing to eat. So solidarity with the lake and so solidarity with the fish is really just an extension of solidarity between people. And I think that we should really take this in our age of the Anthropocene that we cannot allow the luxury to extend our solidarity only to people who have two legs, two, two arms and so on, that we really need to uh, expand our, our, our area of uh, those, I mean, the pool of those who are included. It looks like Paul has his yellow hand raised. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shirley and uh... I've been thinking a bit, you know, the intersection between media, celebrity, economics, politics, culture, power, and, you know, the British royal family are the head of state of Canada, and I don't know anyone, I've, I've only met one person who's fully supportive of that model, and yet it seems that it continues on, and Maybe it's no big deal, you know, they, it doesn't cost that much, they're on the money and you have to take a pledge of allegiance, but, but it, it's, it's something that is so uh, definitive for citizenship, but I'm making the connection with eco-pedagogy and the environment. Why do you think, uh, and besides, you know, the, you know the, our systems are very immovable, but why can't we change that? And at the same time, <laughs> other things, what are your, Thoughts, surely your comments on, I guess the political system just is so uh, anchored in its lethargy that, that we wouldn't win a referendum or there's no, there's no impetus to go that way. I don't know, Paul. I think it's the, pro one of the problems is that um, it's this, I think Jeff might be the only Yankee that's on here. I can't see many others, but, but it's, I think the, um, stupidity of us as humans to think that democracy exists and so consequently we keep working into a system which has never been democratic i mean we're defining our system as democratic and we don't live in it so how can we correct a system that we're defining incorrectly so it becomes oh wow maybe maybe here's where political science actually is a worthy uh a worthy uh academic pursuit. And then when it comes to understanding economics, and you know, like Petar talked about Marx, and you know, I guess some of us deep down in our little Peter McLaren brains hope we could all just be radical Marxists, but we all know what a shit show that was too. And so it's like we have to admit that we have to come up with something and it's back to the notion of of authentic humanism, but all these words and terms don't get us anywhere. I mean, I hate, you know, if Paolo was here, he, you know, he'd say, oh, surely you need to have the pedagogy of hope. Well, I don't know that there's much hope to have at this point. You know, are we, can we do anything and what can we do? What is it we can do without indoctrinating or getting ourselves killed? What about some of you unspoken people? Somebody say something. We know too yeah, many exactly. of you. Please, catch him. Please catch him. Go. Uh, at our university here in Galiza, Spain, um, we're working on, and I think many universities are doing this in communities, on menstruation as um, a means of looking at our interaction also with the environment and just with um you know natural processes 
and linking it all together intersectionally. And it's, a, it's having a strong impact, you know, I think. Um, but that's just one way that, and working closely with students at our university um, along those lines. Um, but it is true that uh, an environmental ed is just not present in, in the school system so much. It is at university, but um, it's tragic. <laughs> I don't know, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Well, is it any, in anywhere? I don't even know, like at where Michael and I were at McGill, uh, media literacy was a insisted course in teacher education. That's very seldom in Canada. I don't know any place that has environmental education or ecopedagogy as a required course for young teachers. So to me, we would start with teacher education, which we all know how successful we are at that. Here it is required. Uh, we, we are just, our, our time has just run out. I suggest that we perhaps take one more question and if there are all comments or whatever, and then surely maybe we should just quickly wrap up. Would you like to go first? Would you like me to go first? Oh, you mean to wrap up? Yeah. Um, oh, we'll always let the white man have the last word. Um, Paul and Gina, thank you so much. I know you have one other collaborator whose name is it Sebastian? I can't remember, but thank you so much for always being there and putting this together. Thank you so much for all of you. Um, uh, Petar and I are glad to put in our emails in here. If you want to contact us, we can send you some swag, <laughs> some free articles, which I'm sure you're all dying to have. But thank you so much for spending your uh, time with us. Same here. Just, just really thanks a lot to everybody who came. I, it was a really, really wonderful, wonderful discussion, and we, which I really enjoyed. And please do contact us with, with, with any ideas or whatever. I would like to really keep in touch with everybody. And again, thanks a lot to the organizers. Gina is here finally. I've seen Paul in many in many uh, uh, presentations, but Gina. Gina, was Gina was Thank you so much, Peter and Shirley. Thank you so much.